Well, welcome to City Church. I know these are unsettling, troubling, bizarre times, uh, but we do hang on to one truth and one reality, uh, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so, Pastor Ryan here, welcome to our Easter gathering. We just reflected on Good Friday a few days ago, and Jesus said, it is finished. Uh, he completed a work that we couldn't do for ourselves, that he died a horrendous death for our sins, for the sins of the world, and now he is risen. And we, we come this morning to celebrate uh, those realities and those truths uh, with you, uh, even though we're uh, in our maybe our living rooms or our, our bedrooms on our phones, on our, on our TVs or our computers, uh, we can still gather together and celebrate uh, the risen Christ. And uh, historically, there, there's been this little saying, this little phrase, and maybe you can do this in your, in your, if you're in your bedroom or your family room or wherever you are, um, is to say that he is risen. Say that to someone around you. He is risen. And then the other person says, he is risen indeed. So why don't you take a moment with your kids, with your family, say, he is risen. And then everyone respond, he is risen indeed. You can shout it. You can yell it because I think this, this morning uh, requires us to shout and celebrate. Uh, just these uncertain, troubling crazy times, and yet we know that Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and that's our hope, uh, that he's conquered sin and death and hell. And so we want to sing about that this morning. We want to hear about that this morning. We're going to have some testimonies about God's uh, grace uh, in our lives as well. Uh, so with that, let us open our time in, in prayer together. Father, we, we come to you, and we come to you with all kinds of feelings and emotions and uncertainty living in this strange world of, of a pandemic, a, a time that we, we, no one could have thought up. And yet we know that our hope and our lives are rooted and grounded in you because the tomb is empty. That Jesus, by rising from the dead, said something to human history. He, he said, it is finished. It is completed, that, that a new creation has broken, a new world has broken, and new possibilities have broken in because of the resurrection of Christ, that he has conquered suffering and death and hell and sin. And he's come to redeem us and restore us and make all things new. So whatever we're experiencing this morning, whatever we're feeling this morning, uh, fears of, of just economic uncertainty, fears of, of suffering, of sickness, worried about our loved ones, wherever we are, I pray that our hearts and our minds and our lives would be rooted in the reality that the tomb is empty. So as we celebrate this morning, Lord Jesus, may you be honored, may you be glorified. Please meet us here in power, in resurrection power. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, New City Church. Happy Easter. It is so awesome to be with you guys this morning. I am so excited and Alicia is too to sing praises to the King Jesus who's risen and from the tomb uh, today. We get to celebrate that. What an amazing gift. So even though it's virtually, why don't you guys sing with us? We're going to sing of the great things God has done. So let's do that.
and stars they wept The morning sun was dead The savior of the world was falling His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The of every curse upon him Because you conquered death. You defeated the grave forever, God. And we are so amazed at your grace toward us. To let us in on that. You didn't have to, but you did. Because you loved us, God. Not because we did anything to deserve anything from you, but because of the love of Jesus. God, we celebrate you today, Lord. We love you. We pray all this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen.
Well, it's uh, good to sing. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Alicia, to, to remember these promises of God and God's grace and God's mercy. Um, I don't know about you, but lately I've just singing and music has just been really helpful just kind of in these times of lockdown and quarantine. And I, I was thinking as we were preparing for this Easter Sunday of some words that were said uh, many actually months ago in our church. We were wor working through a sermon series in Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter one, it says that long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And, and these words from, from the writer of Hebrews that now in this time, in this time in history, God speaks through his son, Jesus. Um, and even in the, the, the gospel writers would say that, that if we've seen the father, we've seen the son. If we've seen the son, we've seen the father. So, so Jesus is the exact imprint, the exact nature of who God is. And so if we want to know what God is like and what he does and what he says, we, we, we look at Jesus and he shows us what his glory is and what his grace is, that he's full of grace and he's full, full of, of truth. And so we, we just came off of Good Friday and, and we looked at a few of the sayings that Jesus uh, said from the cross, these last seven sayings of Jesus, um, it is finished, and, and I thirst, and into your hands I commit uh, my spirit. And so I thought this morning as we look at the, the Easter accounts, the resurrection accounts, uh, what did Jesus say to us? What did Jesus say to his disciples after he was resurrected from the dead? Because we have these, these stories of, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of Easter, and they're very concise, uh, and there's not a, a ton of detail. And sometimes they, they kind of leave us bewildered, like, what is Jesus doing? Why did he do it? But I, but I think the, the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, by focusing on what Jesus says as he comes out of the tomb and as he speaks and meets meets with his friends, his disciples, we gain a lot of insight into who he is and what he's like and what he's up to uh, in, in the world. And so I want to just spend a few minutes here uh, this morning as we celebrate Easter together, looking at a few sayings of Jesus after his resurrection from Matthew's gospel. And so I'm going to be reading from Matthew uh, 28, one of the gospel accounts. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all have accounts of the resurrection. They all have different details. They all highlight different things. But I want to read from Matthew's gospel because I think a few of the things that Jesus says uh, after the resurrection are very enlightening. Uh, so, so let's read that together. Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the day, dawn, I should say, of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for the fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and told, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So this is God's word to us from, from Matthew's uh, account. There's some interesting interactions that are, that are happening. It's the, the context is, is Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. He's, 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 he's been dead for part of three days. It's Sunday morning. It's the Sabbath day. The two Marys come, uh, two of his disciples come to see the tomb. And, and what, what's interesting about this and what is suggested in the other gospel accounts is that these Marys were not expecting Jesus to be raised from the dead. We, we don't get the, the emphasis here in Matthew's gospel, but in John's gospel, they were going to anoint Jesus with spices and herbs because when a, when a body was decomposing in a grave, you would go and anoint them with spices and herbs so they wouldn't, wouldn't smell. Uh, you can imagine the, uh, the Middle Eastern desert, uh, bodies would decompose fairly quickly. And so this was a way to, to anoint the body so it wouldn't smell. So they're, they're going there not expecting Jesus to be alive. 
And so you can imagine as they come up to the tomb, this, this angel shows up, rolls back the stone. The guards are freaking out, as you do when you see a giant angel rolling back the stone where Jesus was supposed to be, and he's not there. They're filled with fear. And he tells them he's not here. He's one of the most stunning phrases in all of Scripture, verse 6. He is not here for he has risen. The Marys came not expecting a dead person to come back to life. They were expecting to find their master, their savior, dead as a doornail in the tomb. They were coming to anoint him. Now, what's fascinating about this is that Jesus has been telling them for three years that I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to rise on the third day. If you read Mark's gospel, Mark 8, 9, and 10, say the same thing, that Jesus, Jesus says, I'm going to die, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to rise again from the dead. And yet, for some reason, the disciples don't have that fresh in their minds and hearts. That They're not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. Dead people don't come back to life. And that's, for me, what makes the resurrection true and, and the narrative account so honest is that, that if I was going to write a fake narrative or write a fantasy or a mythology, it wouldn't look like this. It would be people with robust faith and saying, yes, of course, Jesus said he was going to die and he was going to rise from the dead. I'm at the tomb waiting for him to come back to life. But, but we don't see any of that. His closest friends, his closest companions, his disciples abandoned him at the cross and they abandoned him at the tomb. They weren't expecting a resurrection. So the angel comforts them, tells them to go quickly to Galilee to tell the other disciples that Jesus has risen from the, the dead. And, and notice what it says in verse 9, that, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. So, so, so the, the first little phrase or saying I, I want to focus on here is just the simple, the simple phrase from Jesus, greetings. Now, I've read the, the, the Easter accounts many, many times. I've preached from these, these texts, and, and it would be easy for us to gloss over what Jesus is doing, what he's saying. Now, he, he pauses and he says, he says greetings. Now, in, in the English, it, it might just seem like a, just a, a word of encouragement or just something you say like, hey, how's it going? How's your day going? But not in this context. Not after the Son of God has resurrected from the dead and nobody is expecting a resurrection. And he's front and center with the Marys, his disciples, and he's saying greetings. Now, this word greetings has the, the meaning of rejoice, be glad. It's a, it's a greeting of health and happiness. Rejoice and be glad. I'm, a, I'm alive. I'm here. How are you? Now, remember what I said just a few minutes ago. Jesus has told his disciples multiple times, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the dead. And yet his disciples are nowhere to be found. They, they, they're not coming to the tomb to, because of resurrection. They're, they're fearful, they're scared, they're, there's a lot of unknowns, they're, there's all kinds of doubts, and, and, and our Savior's gone, our leader's gone, what are we going to, to do? And yet here is Jesus saying greetings to his disciples. Be glad, rejoice. That There's no condemnation in his voice. There's no hate in his voice. There's no, where have you been? Why have you abandoned me? I, I, that's probably what I would have done if my closest friends and companions bailed on me was, where have you guys been? I, I've been telling you this was part of the mission. This is what was supposed to happen. And yet you're nowhere to be found. And the response of the Marys is, is very enlightening as well. It says that they came and they took hold of his feet and worshiped him. But right before that in verse 8, it says they were they were full of fear and great joy. There's this, this tension of fear and great joy. Now, now again, I, I love the way Matthew highlights those details of how these, these two disciples are experiencing the resurrection of Jesus. There's, there's fear, and it's not, not a, a reverent fear. This is a, I am scared. I don't know what's going on. I'm not expecting a dead man to come back to life. We're just coming to, to anoint the body and making sure it doesn't smell because it's going to rot very quickly. Th this is not what we expected. We did not expect an angel to show up and tell us uh, that, that Jesus was alive, that he's not here, and you need to go find him and tell the other disciples. This was not part of what we were coming to experience. So there's a, a sense of fear, but there's also a sp sense of joy. Now, these might just be random details, but it's very interesting that when Jesus first shows up on the scene in Matthew chapter 2, 
when Jesus is born in his incarnation, when the Magi show up in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. The, the response to Jesus in the Gospels is you can't, Jesus, you, you can't be neutral with Jesus. There's always a, I, I love him, I worship him, or I hate him, or I despise him. There's no indifference with Jesus. When, when the Magi saw the baby born and, 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 and came and saw him to bring gifts, they, they bowed and worshiped him with exceedingly great joy. We can't even, there's not even an English word to, to say how excited and joyful they were at the sight of Jesus. And Matthew's picking up that same word here, even though it's woven with fear. We didn't expect a dead man to rise. There's great joy in worshiping this Jesus, and we see it in their response. They, they, don't, they don't just say, oh, great, he's, he's alive. It's, they actually wrap their arms around him at his feet and worship him. They know who this Jesus is. It's not just a rabbi in the first century saying pithy things. This is the Son of God risen from the dead. And we also get a hint that Jesus' body, it's fully resurrected. They wrap around his feet. He's not a ghost. He's not a spirit. He's as alive as you and I would be alive, different, but fully resurrected with scars in his sides and scars in his hands and his, his nails. He's there and the Marys are bowing before him to worship him. And Jesus always has that power over us when we see him for who he is. It's, we can't be indifferent with him. There's fear and joy. And, and what, I, what I love about this is, is later on in Matthew's account, when, when Matthew gives the great commission, they, they finally come to, the, the, to Galilee with the disciples and, and he doesn't name them, but he says in verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. There's no identifying who doubted and who worshiped, but there's a mixture, right? There, there's fear and there's worship. There's fear and there's joy. And Jesus has no problem with any of it. He says, greetings to you, blessings to you. Some feared, some doubted. It doesn't matter to Jesus. He understands that that resurrection isn't supposed to happen. He understands that messiahs aren't supposed to die. And yet he meets them right in the reality, in the balance, in the complexity of our joys and of our fears and says, greetings, I'm with you, rejoice. I'm risen from the dead. He's not thrown off by their weak and brittle faith. And isn't that just a, a great comfort to us when we think about how Jesus still speaks to us, that now that God speaks through his, his son, he says those same words to, to, re, to you, Ryan, <laughs> to, to you, whoever's listening on the other side of this camera. He, he says the same greetings to you, even when your, your faith is great, when your faith is weak, when you're full of fear and when you're full of joy, I meet you right in the midst of those things, both of those realities. When you're full of faith and you're full of doubt, I'm right there with you. When you don't understand what is going on in our world, I'm right there with you. Which leads to a, another uh, phrase from the resurrection, another word from Jesus, which I think fits very nicely with, the, with this idea of, of just this greeting and blessing is, he says, secondly, in verse 10, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Earlier, Jesus speaking through the angel in verse four, and for fear of him, the guards trembled, became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. That, that Jesus already meets them through the angel before anything even happens and says, I, I know you're, you're afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Do not be afraid. It, it, again, this is brilliant storytelling from Matthew and the details that he highlights. I mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the Magi are worshiping as Jesus is born. They're, they're worshiping with great joy. Matthew's doing this in, in 28, that Mary's are worshiping with great joy. There, there's this beautiful little sandwich happening here between the gospels, the beginning and the end. But he does it again. He plays on this word of do not be afraid. Remember when the angel comes to Joseph, in Matthew 1, verse 20, he says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear 
to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The, the book of Matthew starts with fear. Of course, Joseph, he's got this, this, this girlfriend he's not even married to yet, and the, and the Holy Spirit is going to put the, the Son of God in her womb. He, he's going to be ostracized in his community, and, and, and the angel shows up and says, I know you don't understand all of this, but don't be afraid. It's going to make sense eventually that Jesus, the Emmanuel, the God with us, the one who came to, to save us from our sins, he's, he's, he's going to be born by, in the womb of Mary. And I know it's crazy and it's, it's, it's weird, but Jesus is doing the same thing. Mary, I understand that this is very confusing, even though I've been talking about it for, for quite a few years now. I'm resurrected from the dead. I'm alive as ever. But don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Everything is in my hands. Everything is in my control. We see this fear is very strong in the disciples, again, showing that they weren't expecting a resurrection, that they were expecting something very, very different. And it didn't include dead men coming back to life because in John's account, in John 20, verse 19, it says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then as the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. The, the disciples are huddled behind locked doors because they're fearful of the Jews that, that might kill them or persecute them. They don't, they don't understand that Jesus is alive at this point. And they haven't seen him yet. And, and, and Jesus comes. He's obviously, this is why I said his, his, his resurrected body's a little bit different because he doesn't have to knock on the door. He can just come right through the door. He's not a ghost, but he's fully resurrected from the dead. And the first words that he speaks to his disciples in their fear is, peace be with you. No condemnation. No, you backstabbing friends. Where have you been? Why have you not listened to me? What, why are you disobedient? He says, first says greetings, and then he says, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. I know you don't understand all of this, but I'm alive. And I've raised from the dead. I, I've, I've come and done exactly what I said I was going to do. I've overcome death. I've overcome suffering. I've overcome sin by my, my resurrection. So don't be afraid. I, I think that the idea of fear and, and the fear that we all experience has has reached ha, has wreaked havoc in our lives on so many levels. I think of I mean our our, our daily lives right today in the, in the midst of a pandemic. How much fear plays plays in our lives? How much has fear shipwrecked marriages? How much has fear ruined bank accounts? How much has fear caused spiritual damage to our our souls? The the fear of, of missing out the fear of not having enough, the, the fear of not having the right relationship, the fear of, of I've done too many wrong things, too many bad things. God could never love me. God could never receive me. The fear of being found out. And here's Jesus speaking a word of grace. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. Peace be with you. The Apostle Paul in his letter in 2 Timothy uh, verse uh, chapter one, verse seven says that, that God has given us not a spirit of fear, but, but a spirit of love and self control because, because fear makes us out of control. And so here's Jesus in a moment where we'd all be expected to be fearful and scared with the unknowns. And he says, don't be afraid. I'm right here. I'm with you. The same God that spoke 2,000 years ago is the same God that says those same words to us today, that God speaks through his son. He hasn't stopped. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the, the character and the nature and the actions of Jesus that we see in him are the same actions and character and the words that the Father speaks to us every single day. Don't be afraid. I've risen from the dead. Everything is going to ultimately be okay. Peace be with you. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear sin or hell or suffering or pandemics or sickness or disabilities or not accomplishing your goals. I'm making you and the entire world new. God still speaks through his son and through his resurrection. The, the, the tomb is empty. These gospel words have 
still meaning and life in them because God has not changed one bit. So many people think of the Easter story as the end, right? It's, it's Jesus lived, he, he died, he rose again, and now it's the end, we all get to go to heaven. But the way that the gospel writers lay out the resurrection accounts is it's actually just the beginning. That on the first day of the week, on the Sabbath, something new has broken in because of the resurrection. Now we're full, filled with a new kind of hope. We're, we're filled with a new kind of power that Jesus is within, with us. The Apostle Paul talks multiple times that by Jesus' death and resurrection, that we are identified, we're united in that same reality. He's already placed us in the heavenly places that we've already been resurrected with him. We already belong to him. We're already secure in him. So imagine how much confidence that would give us to risk our lives for him. How much confidence that would give us each day, even if we're experiencing suffering or experiencing sickness or experiencing a dis disability. How much confidence would that give us in the midst of a pandemic? That I'm with you, don't be afraid. I've been, I'm raised from the dead, I'm alive, and you're alive with me already. There's nothing to fear any longer. And then the, the last phrase, just to, to highlight for us uh, this morning, uh, comes in verse, verse 10. And again, a lot of these details are easy to just gloss over or miss. But he says in verse 10, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there you will see me. Jesus is using familial language, family language. You're my, go find my brothers. Oh, wait, the brothers that abandoned me, the brothers that betrayed me, the, the one that Peter said, hey, I, I, don't, want, I don't even know the guy uh, as, before Jesus is being crucified. He's like, I don't even know who the guy is. That one, yeah, go tell my brothers. You're my sisters, Marys, but go tell my brothers that I'm, I've risen from the dead. It's, it's family language. We see this in other accounts as well, the way that Jesus makes his words personal. They're personalized. They're not distant. They're not, they're not, I am God, I am king, I am master. He's, he, he's saying, you're my friends, you're my brothers, you're my sisters. He does it in, in John's gospel as well. In John chapter uh, 20, when, when Mary, uh, one of the details John gives in his gospel account, when Mary sees Jesus uh, raised from the dead in, in John 20, 16, he says, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the, to the Father. He personalizes and calls out her name, Mary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a personal, it's not a, not, hey, you, it's not, hey, disciple, it's, it's Mary. He, he calls her name in a direct way. Later in, in that same gospel account in, in 21.5, John 21, 5, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. He's resurrected from the dead. He, he wants to cook a meal for them. In verse 5, he says, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? He addresses them as children, as brothers, as sisters, as family. We know in, in Matthew's account, when, when Jesus says, who's my brothers, who's my sisters, who's my mothers, who's my fathers? He says, it's those who do my will. You're part of my family. Jesus' resurrection is very strange because it's not a big public spectacle. He actually comes to his friends, his closest companions. He doesn't stand in, in, in the Roman square and say, hey, I want to tell everyone, hey, look, I'm dead. You thought I was, you were going to kill me and you thought you, know, you were going to get off the hook. I was innocent and yet you put me on trial. He doesn't do any of that. He comes to his closest friends. He comes to his closest companions and says, peace be with you. Greetings. I love you. I'm with you. I don't hold this against you despite your abandon me, despite you not listening to me, even your weak faith, even, even Thomas, who's full of doubt and says, I need to see that it takes him a whole week to embrace Jesus. He, he finally touches his hands and touches his feet and sees the, the scars and says, hey, if you, if you need that evidence, hey, I'll give it to you as well. I'm alive. You can trust me. Jesus meets us as, as friends, as family members. He invites us into his inner circle. We've been talking about that as a church of this idea of cultivating a friendship with Jesus. That Jesus doesn't just say, I, I don't want disciples, but he's looking for friends to be part of his inner circle. That doesn't mean we're equal to Jesus. It doesn't mean we're divine like Jesus, but, but he's saying that's the kind of relationship that I want to have. And, and Jesus models that between him and the father. He addresses him as father, daddy, Abba. 
And so the, the, the same ways in which all the blessings of Jesus fall on him are the same blessings that fall on us that we can call God, Abba, Father, Daddy. He invites us to be friends. And so this Jesus always operates in personal ways. He always operates not in general hands-off ways, but he always comes right to us, just as he is with the disciples. Greetings. Peace be with you. Let's eat <laughs> to his closest friends. And he invites us to be part of his, his family. Well, how, how, does that, how does that begin? How do, we, how do we do that? I mean, if Jesus invites us to be part of his family, what does that require? And, and I think the first obvious one that the scriptures say all the time, and when Jesus began his public ministry, he says, repent for the, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. And, and repentance is really the, the big no that we place on our lives. It's, a, it's an action word. It means to stop. It means to turn Turn away from your sins. Turn, turn away from your ways of thinking. Turn, turn away from your ways of being in the world that are likely wrong. And turn to me. Die to your autonomous self. Die to your self-will. Die to your, your evil and the ways in which you've tried to live your life on your own power, in your own strength. And turn away from yourself and your sin and turn to me. Turn to my grace and my peace. Turn to my love and my mercy. So, to, so to, to become part of his family, just it's simply to turn away from, from all the things, that, the ways in which we've looked away from Jesus and all the things we've filled in the gaps thinking that, that somehow this would be better. And, and this isn't an invitation just to add Jesus to our already busy, chaotic, sinful, idolatrous lives by any means. But it's to lay all those things down and to worship Jesus just like the Marys did, to make him priority, to make him central to our lives. And that, the second move is just simply follow. Jesus talks about that all the time. Just come and follow me. He said that to, to Peter, which I think is one of the most beautiful depictions of God's love and God's grace. In John chapter 21, Peter, the one who abandoned him, the one who said, I don't even know the guy. After he resurrects from the dead, he, he comes to Peter and he says, hey, I want you to lead my sheep. I want you to lead my people. If you love me, you'll lead my people. And, and Peter says, well, Jesus, of course, you know, I love you. And well, I mean, our track record isn't that great, but, but I, I love you. I'll do whatever you, you want me to do. And after having this, this dialogue and this, this exchange, he, says, he simply says, come and follow me. And that's how he invited his early disciples to come. He says, come and follow me. Come and, come and worship me. This is the yes word. This is the yes to Jesus. Yes to obedience. Yes to his ways. Yes to his word. This is yes to listening to him, obeying him, considering him, denouncing anything that gets in the way of this relationship. This is the, the yes. I will follow you wherever you go, even in the uncertainty, even in the unknowns, even when I'm filled with fear and doubt and I don't have everything worked out, I will follow you and trust you because I know that you're good because I know that you, you lived and I know that you died and I know that you rose from the dead. Come and follow me. And the good news with Jesus is that we never walk this road alone, is that we, we do this with friends. Isn't it interesting that Jesus does? He doesn't come just to individuals and, and there's a few examples, but, but most of the time he's, he's coming to this group of people, his friends, his companions, Paul's gospel says that 500 people saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. So for six weeks after his resurrection, he's interacting. He's having meals with, with his friends. He's, he's talking to them. He's explaining the mission and how it's going to continue to go forward, that we never do this. This isn't a privatized thing. This is a, 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 a relationship that happens with a, a family of families, other fellow disciples of Jesus. And so we don't go it alone. The Great Commission that at the end of Matthew's account that we looked at for a few minutes here, to, to go and make disciples of all nations, is it's a baptized community. That we've been baptized by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, this relational God. And now we are, as baptized believers, disciples of Jesus. We, we live this out to go make Jesus known in the world. That he didn't just rise from the dead so that we can say, oh, great, we get to go to heaven when we die. What a great blessing that is, of course. But that's not the whole story. Jesus is alive and something new has broken into human history. And we have good news to tell that sin and death and hell and suffering and pandemics and disabilities and wars and famine and injustice don't have the last say. 
They don't have the last say. As we go out, we, we, can, we can make Jesus look great in how we work and how we live and how we treat other people, how we love our enemies, how we pray, how we forgive, how we, we, we take on the work of the kingdom. In every sphere of, of culture, we have work to do because a new day has dawned because Jesus walked out of the tomb. It is finished. He is risen. He is not here. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's ruling and reigning. And so of all people in the universe, followers of Jesus have a hope, even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of these, these troubling times. And my prayer has been for you, whoever is listening and watching this this morning, that you would experience the good news of the resurrected Christ, that he would come into your life and you would say, yes, I too want to follow. And so we have a, a, a special uh, privilege. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, but then I'm going to share some testimonies of how God has changed ordinary men and women just like you and me by his grace and by his, his resurrection. Let us pray. Father, Jesus is alive. He altered human history. He altered our history. He changed everything because the tomb is empty. That our lives are secure in him. And thank you that Jesus still speaks these words of grace, these words of truth, these words of mercy. He still says to the entire world, peace be with you. Peace is available in me. Greetings, rejoice, be glad, don't be afraid. You may not understand all that's going on in the world. You may not understand all that's going in your life and why things are the way they are, or why things happen the way they happen. But I say, don't be afraid because the tomb is empty. So I pray that the, the, the words of Jesus would get deep in our bones and our hearts and our minds and our souls, that it would change us, that we would truly go out with a new perspective and, and, and a new uh, intentionality of, in our lives, a, a new way of being and doing and living because of the resurrection of Christ, a new hope would settle on us today. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The day Jesus changed my life was before I was even born. It was the day that he died on the cross. I know this is cliche, especially in Christian circles. But I will tell you how this became real to me again. Last year, my 20-year-old son, Sam, was brutally killed. My son did not hang around with the wrong kind of people, and he had not done anything to provoke anyone. He was a sweet, kind, sensitive person. It was inexplicable. And if someone had asked me if I would be willing to give his life in exchange for someone else's, my answer would have been an unequivocal no. As I was struggling to understand how God had allowed this to happen, he revealed to me the choice that he himself had made. He chose to send his son to the world to die for someone else. Jesus had done nothing wrong. The Bible says he was without sin, and actually that was the whole point. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God watched as they whipped, mocked, and nailed his perfect son to a cross to die a slow and agonizing death. I know the pain I am in with just the few details I have of my son's death. I cannot imagine the pain he felt. But he did this because he decided that it was worth having each one of us for eternity. I cannot even fathom it, but I am so grateful. For it means that the moment my son left this life, and probably even before, he was in the arms of his Savior, and happier than he has ever been. And as a follower of Jesus, myself, I know that I someday will see my son again, and the pain that I'm feeling will just be a wisp of a memory. The day Jesus changed my life, he changed the lives of all those who choose to follow him, past, present, and future. The Bible says, to all those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Let Jesus change your life. 
1996, my life would forever be altered. Uh, I drove home from a party uh, drunk and high on the 4th of July, and to this day still don't remember how I got home um, and how I didn't hurt myself or anyone else. But I remember waking up the next morning and just feeling this sense of aloneness and emptiness, and just my, my life was headed down a, a dangerous uh, path. And shortly after this, I began to hear about this risen Jesus, uh, the God that was full of love and grace and mercy, and it began to make sense in me. Um, it began to, to show me that I don't have to be something or strive to be something or um, have it all put together, but there was a God who forgives me and loves me and that's with me um, always. And that's when I became a Christian. And, uh, and it's, Jesus has truly changed my life. Now, every day hasn't been uh, rosy. Every day hasn't been great. There's been ups and downs and trials and sufferings. Uh, but I know that Jesus sustains me by his grace um, each and every day. Our church was kind of challenged to share our faith um, and how Jesus has changed our life. And when I think about the ways that Jesus has changed my life, I think about all of my attempts to be good enough, to be loved, to be perfect, to be wanted, um, that I already was wanted and loved and perfect because Jesus knew me before I was born and he knows all my days and he is with me. Even from when I was young, I can see his hand in my life. And he's just been so gracious to show me in his mercies every day just how much he cares for me and how much I don't have to strive to be loved by him. And so I'm just thankful that um, he continues to open my eyes to to his character and his his love for me and I pray that those that I love um, my friends and my family that they also just feel that freedom that only Christ can give um, who is able to change hearts because I often wish my heart was changed and I've seen time and time again that Jesus can do that and you know when trials and suffering come in my life, as they will in all of our lives, um, I've just seen Jesus be there with me and turn it into deep joy, a joy that's beyond understanding and a peace that's beyond understanding. And I'm thankful that, um, I'm thankful that he'll never leave me and never has. So, May we celebrate Jesus this week and the God of creation <laughs> of this world and that he is on the throne over all things, even this season. Love you all. Well, New City Church, can't think of a better way to think uh, to celebrate the, the good news we've just heard about Jesus, so, uh, defeating death is uh, then seeing about the amazing grace and love of our God. So let's do that today as we close. Why don't you sing with us? <clears throat> sing who breaks the power.
what you did accomplishing the death on the cross, you defeated death forever. And we are free because of it, God. Thank you for your amazing grace toward us. Nobody saves like you. We love you, God. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, New City Church, it's been great to, to gather together. Uh, it's been what, what a uh, just bolstering of our faith to hear those testimonies of God's grace uh, and how God continues to work 2,000 years later in the hearts and lives uh, of people. What an encouragement to us. Uh, I know things are strange and things are odd, um, but we're, we're so grateful that we could gather around uh, the risen Christ. Uh, and I want to leave you with the words of Jesus, who simply said this, and he still says this to us today, peace be with you. Why? Because he is risen. He is not here. The greatest words that the world has ever heard. Go in those realities. Go in God's grace and go in God's peace.